Welcome to week 12 of HI3284. And this week, we're getting feisty. It's contentious history time because history changes all the time. The past doesn't change, the past happened, but history, how we think about the past, changes all the time. It keeps getting rewritten. So we're going to look at that process. We'll look at the history of history and we'll look in particular at the example of Aboriginal history in Australia and how that's been being rewritten over time. I've linked a video where Henry Reynolds takes on Keith Windshuttle back in 2001. It's a while ago. That controversy keeps ticking along a little bit. It's Australia's history war. I've got some resources in the subject site for that and I recommend you have a look at them because it's quite fun to see Henry Reynolds and Keith Windshuttle go head to head. Well, it's fun the first time. So I'll look at that changing interpretation of history. We'll look at why interpretations change, the reasons behind changes in history, and we'll consider how historians interact with that process and how we need to consider our own ethical responsibilities. So here's that outline. We'll be looking at that issue of how history reflects its own time. So does history writing have its own history where we can look at the histories that people are interested in, their approaches to them, and say something about the present that that history is produced in. It's not as confusing as it sounds. We'll look at how historical interpretations change, as I say, focused on that issue of Aboriginal history in Australia. And in connection with that video of Reynolds and Windshuttle, we'll have a look at what is reasonable evidence how do we change our interpretations? Why do historians disagree with each other? And drawing from that, I'm hoping that you will think about your own history writing. History is not polemic. Historians have a duty to be fair to the past, to not make an argument simply for the sake of being clever or to attract attention, but to say something that is fair to the past, fair to the present, based on evidence and interesting. So we'll look at those things. Last year, we were very fortunate that Henry Reynolds gave a lecture at JCU, well, beamed into JCU, and that it was recorded. It's a little long for me to set it as a lecture recording, but it's great fun. And it brings up that question of why what we do up here in Northern Queensland is special and worth doing. Reynolds, I'm sure you've come across before. He's an important figure in the history of JCU history. His work, when he first produced it, was groundbreaking. It's Henry Reynolds, who is largely responsible for drawing attention to the frontier violence that occurred in Australia. This is a little bit old hat now, I know, because of the work of Reynolds. Writing this history of Australian history writing, there is the idea that before this explosion of interest in the 1970s, Australia and the colonisation of Australia was seen as quiet, as non-violent, that there were no frontier wars here. Clearly, that interpretation has changed. And while I want to be clear that the Mabo decision was the result of work by Eddie Koiki Mabo, I'd also like to suggest that he did draw on the resources of JCU in achieving that, and that important among those resources were Henry Reynolds and Noel Luce, both significant figures in JCU history. Northern Australia is important in this process of rewriting Australian history to try and be truer to the past. And it's something that I think we can be proud of at JCU. As you are third year students, and as we're drawing to the end of a third year subject, I'd like you to be familiar with the term historiography. It's not as much of a tongue twister as it looks. Historiography is the study of the writing of history. So it's taking that step back and saying, what are the historians doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? One of the major places that you see historiography is in things that you read without giving them a particular name. That is, in literature reviews. And a literature review is a summary and assessment, not just a summary, very much an assessment of what historians have already written on a particular topic, how they've approached it, or what historians have done that might be useful in approaching a particular topic. Literature reviews tend to appear in the introduction of books 
at the start of journal articles. And a literature review gives something a bit of academic weight because it's a sign that the writer is not just going over the same old ground, that the writer is aware of what has already been done and can engage with those arguments, can assess the use of evidence within those arguments, and generally isn't starting afresh this time, but is building on the work that has already been done. Literature reviews can in themselves be fascinating because history is written in the present, and looking at history, we can see the progress of various presents in the past. I know it all gets a bit meta and the kind of stuff that English scholars have fun with, but as historians, we can keep this very much grounded in what people have written, when, how they reflect their present, and why that's interesting to us now. In the reading for this week, and Peter Reed's chapter, you can see that he goes through a rough outline, a literature review of how Aboriginal history has been written in Australia. And he identifies these evolving schools of thought. He says that before 1939, Aboriginal history in Australia did record the horror of what people saw being done that was unjust. So critics who were actually there and who needed to record what they'd seen and what was wrong about it. That approach to Aboriginal history writing fades. And Reid argues that by the time you get to the 1950s, Australian societies moved on, we were in post-war reconstruction, and we want to believe that Australia is a good place and that we're moving happily, progressively into a golden future, showing our natural ability to advance issues of justice and happiness. That lasts until the 1970s, when young historians, and Henry Reynolds was young back then, when young historians discovered Aboriginal accounts of Aboriginal history, when they were shocked at what they were discovering, and when they discovered as well that the Australian public wasn't quite ready to hear their reassessment of Australian history. Reid identifies the 1980s as a very important period, a period in which Aboriginal people themselves started to cut through and making their understandings of Aboriginal history in Australia public and in finding an audience for them. There's also that issue of archives and when archival material becomes available. Not in Queensland, but elsewhere in Australia during the 1980s, the archives opened in terms of material about the treatment of Aboriginal people within Australia. Reid then notes a renaissance in Australian history writing that there is hope for reconciliation within Australia in the 1990s and there's an ability for Aboriginal people to put forward their own accounts of Aboriginal history. The 1990s though has its efflorescence and passes. We get instead to the John Howard period and to the period I think we're still in, where the federal government at least is not particularly willing to engage with contentious histories about Australia. And we've seen that with the federal education minister, Minister Tudge, announcing that Anzac history as it is taught in schools should not be contentious history. So in Australia, the 1990s was a period of new history writing and of a hope for reconciliation but since 2000, things have become a little bit more difficult for revisionist historians. But Peter Reid, historians and Aboriginal people who want to publish their history in a variety of ways won't shut up. This discussion about what happened in the past and the revisiting of the past, if you like, continues in Australia and continues in Australia around this particular topic. So here, that's a history of history writing. That's historiography. That's an analysis of how history changes, even though the past doesn't. And there are a variety of reasons that history changes. One of the most important ones is, as with that opening of archival material in Australia, new evidence can come to light and new evidence can shake up previous interpretations. It happens all the time. I mentioned a few weeks ago the Palace Papers and the release of those to historians, which is shaking up ideas about the involvement of the Crown in the Whitlam 
dismissal. Elsewhere, things like the Soviet archives opening up after the collapse of the Soviet Union have occurred. And while archives can open, it's worth noting that archives can also slam shut. The Soviet archives are problematic. There was a period of openness and of scholarly exploration of those archives that's becoming more and more difficult as politics changes. And it's not just on the far side of what was the Iron Curtain. In Britain as well, in 2018, archives slammed shut. Those archives dealt with British nuclear testing. They were important to Australian historians. And the files that were for a while accessible are now accessible no more. So evidence can come to light. And intriguingly for historical interpretation, sometimes we have to trust historians in the past who had access to evidence that we can no longer get at. But it's not just new evidence. Historians can use old evidence to draw new conclusions. In my exploration subject, we see this very clearly, that while the explorer's journals have been available for centuries, it's possible to still find new things within them. In particular, in the 1980s and 1990s, anthropologists started to use those journals to both explore how island societies had been in the period that the explorers visited them and to cast light on what was actually going on in encounters between explorers and the locals because of a better understanding of what the locals were seeing and how they were reacting. Part of that process of interpreting old evidence in new ways is the emergence of new fields of history. I'm an environmental historian and I know that environmental history first started to emerge in the 1970s. As a result, there have been new views of the past. We're asking new questions about the past and this is not just for environmental historians. Women's historians do this. Global history as well is a reconfiguration of the past. We're asking different questions. And so, of course, we're getting different answers. And there's personal matters as well. Part of historiography is assessing why particular historians might be asking particular questions and how their personal experience might impact on their interpretation of the evidence. Historians are contrary beasts. Watch Henry Reynolds and Keith Winshuttle go head to head in that late line interview. We're willing to engage and in many ways we enjoy debate. I know that I enjoy discussions about the past, about the evidence and about the variety of interpretations that are possible. And it's important to know that just because history shifts, it doesn't mean that there are wrong bits. Sometimes there are. Sometimes people are using evidence in ways that can't be justified. Sometimes people are using evidence which has been shown to be false. Sometimes people are interpreting from evidence in a way that's perfectly logical and rational, but a new piece of evidence blows their interpretation out of the water. There are those cases, but there are also cases where it is perfectly legitimate to interpret the same pieces of evidence in quite different ways. William Cronin, in that article, and it's a lovely article, goes through this in the case of the history of the Great Plains and of the Dust Bowl in the United States. He looks at two books where the interpretation of what those events mean are diametrically opposed, but neither book is wrong. Once you're aware of historiography and of treating historians as real people rather than perfect observers, then it's possible to see how they can come to very different conclusions, even while using the same evidence in perfectly legitimate ways. And part of the reason for this is the way that historians move beyond the facts, which sounds awful, but actually we need to do to say anything intelligent at all. The facts do not speak for themselves. Historians speak for the facts. And a good historian has a good historical imagination. You need a bit of imagination to imagine the questions that you might ask that have not already been asked. You need a bit of imagination to consider what the evidence might actually be telling you, and you need a bit of imagination to work out where to find that evidence 
in the first place. In addition, it would be very dull history if we could only write about things that we were exactly sure had happened in exactly the way we were representing them. Good history does involve a degree of speculation where it is warranted. What might this mean? How might this have seemed to the people involved? What might their motivations have been? What does the evidence say? Where does the evidence end? And what is it reasonable to suggest? The Australian Historical Association, the peak body for historians in and of Australia, has an ethics statement, which is a very useful thing to read, and it's short. The link is there and also in the LearnJCU site. That ethics statement is interesting in what it says about the practice of history. And the aha does not outlaw speculation because it is what good historians do. It does outlaw the misrepresentation of speculation as fact. It does make it clear that historians should have a strong relationship with the evidence, but outlawing imagination would make for very poor history. And you can see that discussion about imagination and extrapolation, as well as the discussion about what evidence is acceptable and what weight we should place on different pieces of evidence. In the history wars stirred up by Keith Winshuttle at the beginning of the 21st century. Those history wars dragged on a bit, and Keith Winshuttle, I think I should give him credit for improving the quality of footnotes in Australian history. His work stirred people up to make sure their footnotes stood up to scrutiny. And again, this is something we can discuss. What is the role of writing footnotes as part of writing history? The piece of video I have has Keith Winshuttle and Henry Reynolds in debate. Keith Winshuttle did spend quite a bit of time attacking Henry Reynolds. I don't think it was good target selection on his part. Henry Reynolds uses the footnote like a pro, which he is. His work is strongly referenced. There is one case where Keith Winshuttle caught him out in misquoting a source, which given the tools at Henry's disposal at the time he was writing is fair enough. And Henry straight up said, yes, you got me there. I misquoted that one, but it doesn't undermine my overall argument. Winshuttle's work, though, made everyone examine their footnotes and make sure that they would stand up to scrutiny. And here I'm engaging in a little bit of historiography of my own. In 2017, there was a large online map map of massacre sites in Australia launched as part of a project that was run by Newcastle University and headed by Professor Lyndall Ryan. That map sought to pin down massacre sites in a forensic way, so in a way that would stand up in court. It was focused on having clearly linked evidence for each site. It wasn't enough that there was speculation that a massacre had occurred at this place. The project applied firm rules of evidence before it would place a site on the map. And in line with Winshuttle's earlier complaints, it was conservative in its body counts in that it required evidence of people being killed before it would record them as dying at those places. In my view, that map is a response by Lyndall Ryan to the attacks of Keith Winshuttle. It's also a very interesting tool and an interesting insight into Australian history. And what all this points to is that writing history is not a bloodless academic pursuit. History matters to people, and living people have attachments to the past. The past is recent enough that, it, that many histories involve people who are still living, but even histories that are further back in time and where there are no survivors, they still matter to living people. And those topics are important. How do we deal with those topics? How do we investigate those topics? And how do we deal with the sensitivities of the present? I'd like to think that history is a process of reconciliation and not necessarily a battlefield between people with different viewpoints. We write history because the present is interested in the past. 
and we should all consider who it is we're writing for and perhaps what their sensitivities might be and how to present the past in a truthful manner in a way that they can engage with. Perhaps now I'm arguing against history being engaging and that I don't think it should be sensationalist, but there are interesting questions there and interesting questions too in terms of how we serve the present. If we acknowledge that we write about the past, that history is directed by the concerns of the present, then how do we present our work to the people who care about it and have an interest in it? And how do we make it accessible to them? So those questions of how do we present our work, and that goes beyond simply how we talk about our evidence, how we write in a way that allows people to read us, it goes beyond that to how do we use new tools of presentation. For example, the massacre map is a digital object. Should we be looking beyond written words as a means of conveying history to those who have an interest in it? And it involves that question too of what the place of imagination is in the writing of history. How do we treat our evidence? How do we engage our readers or viewers? And how do we create something that is worthwhile and valuable history? So we've got plenty to talk about in tutorial and I look forward to seeing you there.